Då så, välkomna till Globala torget, bokmässan. Vi är på gång med ännu en av dagens programpunkter i detta späckade seminarieschema som vi kör på Globala torget. Det är ju ungefär 50 svenska organisationer och myndigheter för 100 samtal för en bättre värld. Nu till en mycket omdiskuterad fråga. Israel, en apartheidstat. Det är judar för israelisk palestinsk fred som håller i den här programpunkten. Och jag lämnar över ordet till Katarina Katz. Varsågod. Tack så mycket. Tack för att ni får vara här. Jag representerar alltså judar för israelisk palestinsk fred. Vill ni veta mer om oss så har vi en hemsida. jipf.nu Vi är väldigt glada att ha som våra gäster... Anna Johansson, generalsekreterare för Svenska sektionen av Amnesty International och eh, Roy Jellin från den mäns grekiska mänsklighetsorganisationen eh, Betselem. Och eftersom Roy är med så kommer vi att prata engelska så nu går jag över till det. Uh, I don't think I have to introduce what Amnesty International is but I should say that Betselem is one of the major human rights organizations in Israel. It has been documenting and reporting on human rights abuses uh, in the occupied territories as well as in Israel proper. Uh, and it does so in the hope of a future where both people, all people, uh, whether Jewish or Palestinian, can live in peace with equal rights and security. So, uh, to introduce the topic of apartheid, uh, I want to quote one famous Jewish person, Dennis Goldberg, who was a member of the ANC and who was convicted to life imprisonment together with Nelson Mandela. Uh, he came to Israel in 2015 and discovered that this is something that he would call an apartheid state. And he made sure clear here that apartheid in that sense, was not saying exactly like South Africa, but something which is defined in international law. And that is something which is discussed a lot in this report by Amnesty International. So maybe, Anna, you can explain a little bit what is meant by the in, in international conventions by the word apartheid. I will. Oh, whoops, you can hear me. Okay, so... Uh, Lovely to be here, and lovely to be here with you as well, Roy. Um, well, there are uh, three uh, various treaties that criminalize or prohibit apartheid. So the first is in the Convention of the Elimination of All Racial Discrimination, CERD it's sometimes called, where apartheid is prohibited. And there's also an apartheid convention from 1973 that prohibits apartheid. But I think for the purpose of this conversation, uh, we, Amnesty, often talk about the crime of apartheid, which is defined as a crime against humanity in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the ICC. And there's, there's a, a three-part test to define apartheid. So first, there needs to be systematic and institutionalized oppression of one racial group over another. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is that there's an intention to maintain this domination of one racial group over the other. And the third criteria is that there's uh, inhumane acts perpetrated in the context of this systematic uh, institutionalized oppression. And what does an inhumane act mean? Well, it's, it's basically a serious human rights violation. So torture, unlawful killing, displacement of people, um, there's a number of, of, uh, number of uh, examples, but I think this, this shows that apartheid as a, as a concept is, is a question of legal analysis and it's a question of empirical analysis. Mm. And I think Betselem has in its publication not so got on so much in detail in the legal analysis, but much, much more in the empirical descriptive. So maybe you would like to add to what Anna has been saying. Um, 
apartheid does not exist as a definition just in the co historical context of South Africa. As said before, it's also um, defined in international treatises and law, and also in political science as a term. Um, in just one sentence, it's really like to sum up those three um, tests for what constitutes apartheid. It's um, the domination of one group over an another by means of um, structural violence, uh, practices, and legislation. And this is unfortunately the facts that we have been documented for many years in the occupied territories in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and in the Gaza Strip. Uh, but over the years, um, we, 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 when my organization started, we described the situation as occupation. Uh, but occupation is supposed to be a temporary situation. And Israel has changed the facts on the ground by building settlements, by enacting more and more cruel um, steps that violate very basic Palestinian human rights. We're talking about, for example, the closure of Gaza from the outside world for, for 15 years. Um, and the, since the situation changed, also our description and our analysis had to take into account the changes that took place on the ground. And after examining those facts, we reached the conclusion that, in fact, what uh, Israel is doing is perpetrating a regime that is intended to enforce um, on all Palestinians um, a rule of Jewish supremacy. And this regime is between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. So also um, Palestinians that have Israeli citizenship are not in fact equal in their rights to Jewish citizens like I am. Mm. Uh, I think also there were some legal things that I was happening in Israel itself, which may have been a reason for you to, to use this term? So, in, to prove the intent uh, of Israel to perpetuate um, this regime of Jewish supremacy, um, so there are, of course, the facts on the ground, the establishment of permanent Israeli settlements in the area that Israel occupied that constitute changes, and, 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 oh, and of course, those things were litigated in, major, in different Israeli courts and were approved by the courts. Um, but in addition to that, in 2018, Israel has legislated basic law, Israel as the state of the Jewish people, therefore enshrining Jewish supremacy as a constitutional principle in Israeli legislation. And that, of course, is another smoking gun um, that shows that Israel wants to perpetuate this type of discriminatory regime. Anna, do you want to add something to this? Or it's um, well, in, in our report, and I don't know if you're coming on to that, what, the one thing that we've said, because obviously there is a growing body of evidence, there's a growing number of bodies that are using this term to describe what goes on in Israel. And, and the thing that we've said as, as Amnesty International is that we consider this to, to be the case wherever Israel has exercises control over Palestinian rights. So in, in Israel's sovereign territory, but also in the occupied territories, and also in regards to refugees who are not allowed to return. Mm. Israel also exercises, controls the, exercises the control over their rights. Mm. So that's why we've applied this term to, to all of these territories and, and beyond. Mm. If we look in the occupied territories, that's mainly the West Bank, uh, the Golan and East Jerusalem, which are annexed, are a slightly different story. Uh, but there you have uh, military laws that are applied to the Palestinians, whereas Israel has temporarily, since 1967, extended its own civil law to Israeli citizens who are on the West Bank. So there you can see very clearly that there are two legal systems. But I think it's more, there are also other differences which are more subtle and not only in the legislation, in the terms of rights? Um, let's say um, we all know that we need a roof over our heads. I think this is probably the best example. Um, and I don't want to address only the West Bank, but also Israel proper. Um, we need a roof 
Um, so since 1948, that's the year that Israel was established, um, over 1,000 different uh, villages, cities, um, places of residence were constructed for Jews and only eight for Palestinians. That, those eight are, in fact, uh, were built only in the south of Israel to concentrate uh, Bedouin uh, Palestinians in, and take over the land uh, for the benefit and for the constructions of other Jewish settlements. Um, since 1967, the same type of policy is, uh, is enacted in the West Bank. So Israel has constructed over 200 um, settlements, but not a single Palest um, place of residence or city or a village for Palestinians. And of course, if, Pal if a Palestinian wants to build, wants to have a master plan for the village, I'm talking about communities that have been there for m many decades before Israel has occupied the area, uh, they don't get a permit. Um, and if, Israelis, if Israeli Jews are building without a permit, uh, the likelihood of their house uh, demolished is close to zero, whereas for Palestinians, it's close to certain. Uh, so this discrimination and this like uh, life without security, being exposed, um, never knowing um, whether you'll be able to return to home and if your home is still there is something that has been going on and it's very clear that uh, this is, it's, it's different for Jews and for Muslims. Also, um, in East Jerusalem there is a process which has led to a lot of protests in the recent years of the same process going on of Palestinians being gradually squeezed out from uh, areas where they have been living. Uh, and maybe there is a quite a lot written about that in a report. Maybe you could tell us a bit on that. Well, well it's hard to know where to start because there's so much. But I've, I think we've looked at five different areas where we see these, uh, the, these very systematic and institutionalized differences. Mm. Um, land is one of them. But I think freedom of movement, citizenship, civil and political rights, social and cultural rights, there's so many areas where you can say it, it's not uniform, it's not the same, uh, and it does vary if you're an Israeli citizen, if you live on the West Bank, if you live on the Gaza Strip, but there's so many differences in terms of what rights you actually have access to and how you can uphold those rights. If, if those rights are violated, who, who will uphold them for you? Um, but I was thinking in terms of... Um, of, of the West Bank, for example, that 10% now consists, uh, at least 10% consists of illegal settlements. Uh, th that is quite striking, that's quite significant in terms of, of, of uh, and, and also what you were saying of how existing villages are not recognized, you know, they're mm. cut off. They, they may be not even on the map, on the official maps, they won't be shown on the map. They're cut off from electricity, they're cut off from water supply. The children won't be allowed to go to school, etc. So it's it's very striking the difference, um, even between Israeli Jewish citizens and Israeli Palestinian citizens. Mm -hmm. um, you used the term illegal settlements. Just to clarify, all settlements in the occupied territories uh, are illegal by international law. But then half of them are not illegal by Israeli law, but half of them are illegal even by Israeli law, just to, to, to clarify the question. Uh, uh, Beth Salem has also, you, you've already talked a bit about inside Israel, because Beth Salem on its uh, webpage, it says that there is a, kind of, well, I'm, I'm quoting from memory, that there is an illusion that they don't, that, that is incorrect, that Israel is an occupying power on the West Bank, but a democracy inside the Green Line, that is the 1967 borders. And you dispute this. So we challenge this perception that there are two regimes that coexist simultaneously. Um, we challenge this because this situation has been going on for decades. We're now entering soon the 56 years of, since the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. And, um, and, and so it's, it's, 
an occupation by definition is a temporary situation. Talking about uh, four and almost fifth generation that are born into this situation, talking about it being temporary is divorced from reality. Um, and when in fact we're looking at the statements of Israeli leaders, including the prime minister, including senior officials, they are saying very clearly that Israel will not leave the West Bank, uh, that Israel does not intend to change the situation, and therefore we can't um, have it. Is we can't have it like both ways. We can't claim that this is temporary on one hand, and and also declare that it's forever on the other, uh, without that having consequences. And one of the consequences is to the outcome. What we have now, and we have this for many years now, is a one-state reality with unequal rights. And one-state reality with unequal rights constitutes apartheid. Mm -hmm. Could you also uh, say a little bit about how your, the report was received internationally and in Israel? Um, I don't know if there, um, I don't know if there's one way to describe it, how it was received globally. Um, I think in Sweden, I think we've had some positive, uh, positive and constructive conversations, but there's also been people who've been querying and, and opposing our analysis and our view. Um, um, I think it is important to say that you know, there are now a number of organizations. So Betzalem was first out, then Human Rights Watch, then Amnesty International, uh, latest a special rapporteur on, on the occupied Palestinian territories, who've also come out and said that he thinks that this, this is apartheid. So I think there's something to say for that, that there is a growing consensus. Uh, but I think it's good that we're, having th that we're lifting this up, because I think for far too long, uh, there's been lack of accountability on these very serious human rights abuses uh, suffered by the Palestinians. And maybe you could comment I, on... I would like to say, first of all, that this um, conclusion has not been easy for us to reach. I mean, it's very painful to understand that the place you grew up and the place that you love is doing something like this, but part of a healing process is diagnosing the illness it's never nice to hear that you have something which even might be terminal, but it's also better to treat it and to, to, to change it. And this type of regime that we have, the violations of human rights, is something that people do and people can also change it. And this is what we're trying to do. We have a, vision, a different vision for the place that we live where everybody enjoy equal rights, where everybody are living in a democratic situation, where everybody has a voice and where everybody can build a better future. And I think this is like something positive to do. And I think that even reaching a painful conclusion can ensure that you have some, that you improve your situation rather than continuing this spiral downward of, of you know, the things exacerbating for the worst, like we have seen in the past uh, decades. Um, in, in, in regards to um, how, uh, how it was received in Israel, um, we thought that it will take a lot of time because it took us a lot of time to um, write this position paper and to uh, recognize the problem. Uh, but surprisingly enough, um, a month late after our publications, we conducted a public opinion survey in which we found out that 25% of Jewish Israelis actually agree that the situation uh, of apartheid exists. So, and, and of course, uh, needless to say that among Palestinians, it's the mirror I image. 75% of Palestinians think that the, the description of, regime, of the regime as an apartheid regime fits the definition. Uh, so, Actually, that was very encouraging for us. We thought that it will take us much longer to persuade that significant chunk of the Israeli population that what we're dealing with is in fact apartheid. Mm -hmm. um, I think here the word apartheid is really like volatile, but you have to know that in Israel it's widely discussed, it's used almost daily in the media. 
people know what we have and people discuss it. Um, and this fear of using the word is, should really like be lifted. It should be used and we should work against it. We should work against the apartheid, not trying to put it off the vocabulary list of words that we can say and use. Uh, just to round off before we have to finish, uh, Roy, what can the international community do, civil society organizations, governments, and so on, to assist in the defense of human rights in Israel and the occupied territories? But, but very briefly, because we're nearly out of time. We're, if we are out of time, so just a few seconds. I will be very brief. Introduce consequences. Violations of human rights and of international law should, uh, be, in, um, have, should be accounted for. Uh, right now we have zero accountability and because of that the situation continues. Okay, thank you very much Anna and Roy that you are here and that you've been sharing your knowledge here.